No? Oh, okay. Oh. Perfect. All right. Good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank uh thank you everyone um for for being here and thank you to the organizers. This has been a fantastic workshop. Um I uh, as 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 uh, someone who was going last, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I wanted to see what other people did. Um, but also, as we had, as we moved to a hybrid format, um, the, the comments that I did want to make were also predicated on a talk that probably most of you have seen because it was recorded. Um, has, raise your hand if, you, if you've watched the recording of Leo Wong and Gabe Grant's talk. Okay, probably nobody watched it. So this is this paper that, that Sydney referred to. And I'm going to spend a lot of my talk, actually, it's going to be somewhat duplicative, but you should watch their version because they are much better. They're the ones who did this work. It's really cool work, along with Jacob Andreas. He and I are the co-senior authors and also uh, Vikash Singa and Noah Goodman and Alex Lev, who's another MIT student. So I'm going to talk about the, the, some of the general ideas here, both because I think they're interesting, relevant, and because they also really reflect the way I think about um, language and thought and the perspectives that modern large language models have to offer here. Okay. Um, so what we're interested in specifically what we call language informed thinking, all the ways that language connects to and reflects deeply and broadly our general kinds of thinking, right? The ways we reason about situations and events and predict probabilistically what might happen with some sense of the underlying causal structure. As a causal reasoner, I think maybe it's related to that. Um, okay, that's, that's weird. Really weird stuff going on. Hmm. Okay. Um, does anyone have a power cable? It might be that if I put, yeah, if I plug in that, it might be more stable because something funny is, yeah, thanks. Do you have an, is, uh, all right, sorry. My guess is, I'm not sure what's happening, but hearing that fan makes me think something's using a lot of power and who knows what that's going to be. Okay. All right, sorry. So, um, Language informed thinking, all the ways that um, you know we can use language to talk about situations and and um, the, the causal factors that might affect probabilistic outcomes, um, ways we can reason about structured relations, for example, family kinship, again, probabilistic relations. This question doesn't have a unique answer, but you can make a reasonable guess. Um, all the ways in which we think about and talk about people's goals and plans, both predicting what they might do and understanding why they did what they did, and all the ways we can talk about the physical world, what we see, what we could do, um, what, and again, the causal forces in play in, in physics. Language isn't just a way to, to engage with these many domains of thinking, but it changes how we think. It, it provides a mechanism for learning new concepts and even learning whole new systems of concepts or intuitive theories. So, how does this work, <laughs> right? This is the big question that I think animates many, many of us in at, in the field and, and what brought many of us to this field in the first place. Right? I'm not a language person, but I can't deny that language is the singular thing about human cognition. And it's always been fascinating to me. So I'm really excited to be able to work on it here. Okay. Um, I think we, looking back across the history of different approaches in cognitive science, there's many different ways that people have tried to formalize the, the relation between language and thought, effectively meaning in computational terms. Here are four traditions. Um, the tradition of, of thinking about compositional logical aspects of meaning and the ways in which they underlie um, reference and coherent thought, distributional statistical aspects of meaning, um, what you can get from just you know patterns in language and, and as, as it's used and um, how that captures, for example, semantic association and similarity. Um, the, the grounded and, or embodied aspects of meaning, that something like meaning as grounding out in perception action units and the basis for guiding our plans in the world and the pragmatic or communicative aspects of meaning and how language uh, you know, functions to, to support social cooperation and coordination. Okay. These, are, these are whole traditions. It's not particular theories, but they're whole traditions of theorizing. Maybe the you know, sort of earliest ones in semantics and linguistic theory emphasize symbolic approaches 
Um, certainly, you know, in psychology, there's been a lot of interest over decades in distributional or statistical approaches, and the recent activity in large language models reflects like the consummation of that, both on the computational side, but also it's no surprise that psychologists are fascinated by the potential for really seeing what that looks like at scale. Okay. Um, the message that I have here <laughs> is that I think all of these approaches have something to offer, crucial. And what we should be aiming for is some kind of grand unified theory. So I don't think we have that, but I think actually in the work that we're trying to do here and what, what I think a number of different people in the field are trying to do, we're glimpsing steps towards that. So that's the high level picture. I'm, I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the talk after I say a little bit more specifically what we're looking at. Um, just to kind of um, dig into more the difference between what I would say is, you know, the, the approach represented by modern LLMs, like if you think those are an adequate account of meaning and the relation between language and thought, what you're basically saying is that you want to start off with the approach to modeling language distributionally, which, and which you know, has a very long history, whether it's Elman's recurrent neural networks or sequence modeling, Landauer and Dumais latent semantic analysis, topic models that I, along with Tom Griffiths and Mark Stivers and many others worked on a couple of decades ago, um, various distributional clustering methods, so, so many kinds of things, okay? Um, and the, But the idea, then you could call this the scaling LLM hypothesis, is if you just do that on a big enough scale, that thinking will in, emerge somehow. And why should it emerge? Why is that a possible proposition? Because language reflects thought, right? Language is produced by thinkers. And so if you, if you can capture the patterns in how language is used on a big enough scale, per, um, perhaps all the different aspects of thinking will be emergent in that predictive system. But from a human, and 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 you know, we, we we've seen remarkable things that kind of look sort of like that. And I'm not going to try to assess those claims here. I'm just going to point out all the ways in which the relation between language and thought is is so different in humans, right? For humans, um, we as babies, or and as other animal, or other animals, both evolutionarily and develop, de developmentally, we think before we have language, right? There's, it's very clear that thinking precedes language. Okay. Um, we also, of course, learn language from far less data than these models do, orders of magnitude less, as many people have pointed out. Um, our language winds up being implemented in um, modular language-specific networks in our brain that interface with other kinds of mul multiple cognitive systems. Right. So language clearly isn't all of thinking as far as the brain is concerned. And I think most strikingly, as the work of Susan Golden Meadow and others have shown, is that um, you, you know, even if you grow up with zero language input, children basically invent their own proto language and home sign, and you bring a few of those together in a few generations, like in the Nicaraguan sign language, and they create a whole language. So it's really thinking comes first, I think, and language builds on that foundation. the The way we're thinking about this, and again, this is a this is our proposal, but many many people have some version of this idea, is you know, thinking is is most fundamentally systems for building models of the world, um, reasoning about the world from all the different data you have, perceptual as well as language, making plans, thinking about the problems that you have to solve. And of course, as Andy said so, so well earlier, it's also about the goals um, that bring you to building models of the world in the first place. Okay. Um, we can think of learning language as learning a system of mappings between our thinking systems and externalizable simple systems. Okay. And it's not just it's not just that language builds on thought, but there's clearly as as we go on through our lifetimes and across lifetimes across generations, language and thought continue to develop together in a in a really striking bootstrapping cycle. So I don't want to say it's just thinking and then language on top of that, but you start with language and then thinking and 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 some um, cycle of innovation builds there. So the work that, that we've been exploring is how we can use large language models together with other ideas from computational cognitive science for thinking about thinking to realize, realize this idea. And it, it, you can think of it as taking some ingredients from classical symbolic approaches, as well as from the recent LLMs. And you, know, you could call this a neurosymbolic probabilistic synthesis. It's another way to think of it. But here's sort of a sketch of the framework that we've been developing. We look at natural language, including different kinds of set sentences and utterances, ways of talking about general abstract knowledge of the world or expressing observations or asking questions. Those, are, those all can be effectively translated into a certain kind of language of thought. Here we use what we call the probabilistic language of thought based on probabilistic programming languages. I'll say more about that in a bit, but if you're not familiar with that phrase, 
Um, I'd say that your go-to reference would be the chapter by Noah Goodman, uh, Toby Gerstenberg, and myself um, on concepts in the probabilistic language of thought, or the probmods.org web book, which sort of realizes this vision and some computational tools you can play with. But this, this is a very general way of building systems for world modeling and inference. And you can see statements in this probabilistic programming language as effectively a semantic parses of utterances in natural language. And then all the, all the thinking happens inside that probabilistic language of thought. Okay, various ways of doing inference, Monte Carlo inference or other kinds of approaches to produce um, the, uh, the, the outputs of thinking basically. Okay. Um, so in, in, the, in this particular paper, we implement this idea using what are effectively off-the-shelf tools, um, LLMs, but particularly code LLMs. So this has come up a little bit in some of the earlier presentations, but as I think many of you are aware, um, the, you know, uh, many modern language models are not just trained on text representing natural language, but on source code. And that means um, programming languages that are designed to be written and read by humans as well as machines. So they're written not in natural language, but in kind of language-like syntax, all right? And the, uh, they, they also have you know, comments in natural language, of course, good source code, but just the fact that functions and variables are named with natural language terms is a very powerful source of, of in statistical information, which allows these modern LLMs, code LLMs, to translate in all sorts of ways between natural language and statements in programming languages. So we're using Codex, which was the first open AI tool to do this. And it's much smaller and simpler than GPT-4, which I think is really important because part of this, this research program, we think, is that you, if you should be able to learn language, whatever language is, from much less data than um, you know, something like GPT-4 requires because much of, mo much of the work of thinking really is being done by something that isn't language. Okay. Um, the particular probabilistic programming language that we use in this paper is Church, which was what, uh, developed by Noah Goodman and Bakash Mansinga and others in our group uh, about 15 years ago. Church is a really beautiful thing. I'm not going to, I'll show you some examples here. Um, I love Church. What can I say? <laughs> not that Church, this one. It's named after Alonzo Church. Um, and um, uh, if the, the V1 or version one of ProbMod's web book, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll introduce you to church if you want to see, but it's, there's many probabilistic programming languages, but what this one, what's distinctive about this one is it's written in a dialect of Lisp scheme where the statements are relatively close to, to what we think of as the grain of semantics at the sentence level. And that's really important because what we're going to be doing here, and again, this is about small models and simple models, um, is we're not, as, as maybe some people might be aware, uh, is often done in AI these days. Um, or in various tech applications, we're not going to be, say, um, asking Codex to write a whole long piece of code from a short bit of language, like write a function that does blah, 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 and produces out, you know, tens or hundreds of lines of code. Rather, we're using the code LLM to translate at roughly this, you know, one sentence to one line of code, one sentence to one line of code, because we see it as a reflection of a semantic parse, basically. Now, there's, but there's many different ways to do it. That's just the particular vision we're trying to realize here. Okay. So in this paper, which you can read on archive, it's, it's quite a long paper, um, hopefully some value in most of its pages. Uh, um, you can see applications of this idea to various kinds of probabilistic and causal reasoning, like the Bayesian tug of war, um, classic domains of relational reasoning, like family uh, kinship relations, um, various kinds of uh, perceptual and physical scenes and both static and dynamic, as well as like planning and theory of mind applications. And, and in, in each of these case studies, what we're trying to do is show how you can capture different kinds of linguistic meanings in the code in the probabilistic language of thought in church programs. So for example, that could be, again, statements that are just general pieces of world knowledge, statements um, observing um, aspects of the current situation, which turn into conditioning statements in, in church and then questions of various sorts, which turn into queries. And, and what Church will do is basically, for, to, to the Bayesians out there, um, think of the abstract world knowledge sets up a probabilistic generative model in traces of the probabilistic program on possible worlds. So it's kind of like possible world semantics, but it's probable world semantics. It sets a prior over possible worlds. Okay, Then you condition on information, and that conditions the prior to a posterior. And then th that posterior has the information that can be read off in various queries. But, you, but unlike, say, for example, in a, in a traditional graphical model or BaysNet, where there's a fixed finite set of random variables, 
Here, you can literally ask the model anything. Any computable or any, any statement in this Turing complete uh, computable language, um, if, it if it can be expressed in natural language and the parse can be recovered, you can query the system in that way. So just to illustrate a little bit about how we how we use this, I'll just show one of the case studies from the paper um, with this Bayesian tug of war example that uh, Toby Gerstenberg and Noah studied. Um, so here we, we might describe various matches between teams of players and in work that they've done and continue to do, shown that uh, probabilistic program models can do a, a very good job of capturing many different intuitions people have about the underlying strengths or laziness of the players and so on, and possible predicting outcomes of future teams and so on. Um, this is what a church model looks like that defines um, the, the generative model that says players have some strength, occasionally they're lazy. When they're lazy, they don't pull as hard as they would otherwise. The total strength of a team in any one match is to just sum up the pulling strength of all the people, factoring out the people who might be lazy. And then the result of a match is the team which pulls harder wins. Okay, That's the basic form of the model. And we can give that an, as a prompt to a, an LLM, along with a couple of just statements in English and the corresponding semantic parses. So it's a very minimal prompt. But that's enough to now build a system that can reason in this domain from natural language. So for example, we can describe a, a situation between some hypothetical people. These happen to have be people who have the same name as the authors of the paper. Um, so um, it's more fun when my students, Leo and Gabe do it, because now it sounds like I um, am um, uh, asserting my dominance, but whatever, they <laughs> they turn the tables in the end. All right. Um, Josh won against Leo. We can condition on that information. Josh proceeded to claim victory against Alex. Um, note here how the language model is able to deal with, you know, um, superficial differences. We're not like, we're not talking about the literal meaning of Josh proceeded to claim victory against Alex, but rather the, the effective pragmatic meaning and context in the context of this world model or this problem under discussion. Those two very different kinds of sentences turn into basically the same uh, condition, kinds of conditioning statements in the model. Um, even working as a team, Leo and Alex still could not beat Josh. So now there's another match where Josh won against Leo and Alex. And now we can ask questions like, how strong is Josh? And this turns into a query where the probabilistic programming language computes a distribution on strength. And the mean was 50, and now you get a distribution whose mean is something bigger than that, like 67. So, you know, a, a, a lot higher, uh, almost two standard deviations above the, the population mean. Um, what are the odds of Gabe beating Josh? Who's Gabe? Well, Gabe is another person. We haven't talked about them, but but Church will sample from the prior and say, well, this pretty strong person, he's probably going to beat this generic new person I've I've talked about, and that, that's what the model computes. Um, we can add in other sort of information, like um, Gabe, actually, he wrote this example. So <laughs> in a huge upset, Gabe managed to beat Josh. Um, that's, and then now that could be shaded in different ways, because it could turn out that, well, Josh has a propensity to slack off, which the model will interpret as a statement about Josh's laziness. Or maybe he's rarely lazy, and then we condition in a different way. De but depending on which of these three things, if we include neither of those statements or one or the other, when we now query about how strong is Gabe, we're going to get different distributions. And this reflects basically a kind of explaining away, if you're familiar with that from Bayesian inference, but now in this language-based mode of thinking. We can add new concepts, like we can introduce these, the concept of a team, and we can now ask the questions like, like, is Gabe stronger than the weakest player on the faculty team? Things that require in the semantic parse some more sophisticated computational machinery, like arguments or statements like all or, or map functions, okay? Um, and use this to answer questions that have some more interesting kind of quantified structure, like is Gabe stronger than the weakest player on the faculty team? or what's gonna happen in, in a match between the students and the faculty. And again, now we're making some, some general statement about this particular team. The faculty are kind of slackers. We need to be able to parse that and that's going to change the meaning. So these are just, you know, a, just a little bit of examples of what this approach to language informed thinking looks like to hopefully spark your imagination. Um, the, the, the power of, of the, the probabilistic language of thought here, the probabilistic programming language, is that it also provides through the, the, the other interface surfaces of a programming language, interfaces to these other cognitive systems. So for example, perception systems like via graphics engines and inverse graphics uh, as approaches to perception for imagining and grounding the world models in perceptual data. 
or if we want to reason about dynamic physical situations, you know, we church happens to have a physics engine in it, and you and for our intuitive physics, we do probabilistic inference over that. Or we can put in planning engines if we want to be able to talk about and reason through language about what people are likely to do based on what we know about their preferences, or work backwards from what they've done to what we think they want. Okay. Um, so we we show in the paper ways to again ground out observations and questions in these kinds of domains, whether it's perception or dynamic physics um, or planning and inverse planning. Um, we, we might also ask, so the, pap the, this, the, the paper on archive is, is really just a, 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 a big white paper, a proposal for how to think about language and thought in this way. But in some ongoing efforts, including a couple of papers presented at, at the COGSI conference, um, we show how you can actually use this to implement quantitatively predictive models of language-based thinking in some of these domains. So I don't have time to do more than just um, highlight one of them, like for example, this one by Sed John here. Is Sed in the room? I don't have a picture, but here he is in the front row. Um, so working with Gabe and Leo, um, he took a domain which our lab has studied quite extensively over the years, intuitive physics, where we've asked people like, you know, given these stacks of blocks, which ones are likely to fall, how unstable is a tower, and we've modeled that quantitatively with, with basically probabilistic simulations in a game style physics engine. But uh, what, what has always to me been so interesting about intuitive physics and again, probabilistic program like simulations is you can reason about not just very familiar questions like will the stack of blocks fall, but I can show you these other weird towers, towers here with the red and yellow blocks and ask an unusual question, which you know we've all been reasoning, I mean, most of us have played the game Jenga, but whether it's Jenga or Legos or whatever, reasoning about whether something will fall or not or how unstable something is, is a very familiar kind of judgment. But a question like this one, suppose that you bump the table hard enough to knock some blocks on the floor, will you knock off more red or yellow blocks? That's not a task that you've had practical experience in, um, unless you've been in this talk before, right? Or me talking about intuitive physics. Rather, it's just a question that I can just give you zero shot using language. And somehow you use your meaning representation for that sentence combined with your mental world models to answer the question. And we've previously shown that you can build quantitatively predictive models in both of these cases. But what we haven't done until now is been able to actually make the language part work. So this is what Sed looked at. The inside thinking is just running a few simulations like these. But what Sed does here is shows how you can take a wide range of situations like these red, yellow, uh, these red, yellow block scenarios and take just describe the scenes um, in language, turn those into conditioning statements in this is here we're using actually web people um, uh, as opposed to uh, church, a different probabilistic programming language. But then the, the model constructs a simulation in its mind, runs the runs a few of those simulations to answer the question. So for example, just to show you like what's going on, if we might describe a scene, the model doesn't actually see anything. We just describe a scene like there's one tall stack of red blocks and two short stacks of yellow blocks. The model parses those into these statements in its language of thought, which then turns it turns into an into its internal model a simulation like this, and it simulates a couple of collisions like this and can just count up the effects and answer the question accordingly. Or here's a more complex situation, leads to a more complex scene, but the simulator doesn't care. Um, the simulator can still do a few of these simulations and come up with a reasonable answer. And, you know, pretty much out of the box, like, I mean, again, I was really impressed by this and a lot of credit to said, but also some to both LLMs and public <laughs> programming languages. This basically worked the first time we did it. Um, namely, you know, the, 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 the model with very little tuning was able to quanti quantitatively predict along the x-axis people's average judgments in a range of both simple and complex scenarios. Um, we've also implemented a similar kind of idea in an inverse planning setting. This was a workshop paper by Lan Xiang and many of the other members of the same team, but I don't have time to talk about that, but I highly encourage you to check it out. It also shows similar kind of quantitative tests of this idea in more of an inverse planning setting. Um, mostly future work, but again, some things that we, that we try to identify are, are going to be really important for making this program work is to think about how not just can you ground language and world models, but use them to grow new concepts and new world models. And we show examples in the white paper, like ways of giving explicit concepts, like in a kinship domain, just introducing uncle, that's a familiar term, but also things like a pibling, a, gen a, pibling, a gender neutral term for aunt or uncle, which the model can effectively turn into 
a, a semantic parse that can be integrated with your world knowledge or even more unusual terms like this, the Northern Piot term, the Pani, I don't know how to pronounce that, for the sister of one's father. And then these get, get immediately integrated with your kinship system. Or more interestingly, maybe implicit examples like basically versions of syntactic bootstrapping in the grounded physics domain, where I can describe these, these weird things like a Pelgi Dax is gorping. And you might not know how to imagine that, but you know that a Dax is a thing. It's probably gonna be picked out by its shape, at least in this domain. Pelgi might refer to its color or some appearance and gorping is some kind of, um, uh, you know, action. Okay. Um, so those are examples of how um, the, the, the language model uh, can take advantage of both explicit definitions and kind of implicit using the semantic types, which are which are correlated very strongly with syntax in, in language to, to figure out concepts of the right type, um, at least the skeletal versions that can then be filled in from additional experience. And maybe most interestingly, ways in which language can give you a whole new world model. So like for the Bayesian tug of war, we gave the generative model in code, but you could also imagine doing like what we do in our experiments um, or in our papers on this, which is we describe the generative model at first in, in uh, the domain model first in English. And to do this, we gave a prompt, which was just a different kind of game set up or a few other kinds of examples of describing generative models. Actually, this one uh, isn't a game, but it's but it's related. We have other ones which are more like games. And then now we can, we can um, uh, just take English and turn that into um, code for the uh, uh, you know for the uh, for the Bayesian tug of war. So we could just describe, for example, this is the the natural language input. Strength levels vary widely from person to person. That's note that's not exactly the Gaussian distribution that we had the, the other one, but it's a reasonable distribution. Um, each person has some percentage of time that they're lazy, and it's, so it's writing code that isn't exactly the same ones that we built, but this, these are reasonable parses into the, the probabilistic programming language of these statements in English, and it can build up the world model that it needs to make reasonable guesses in this domain. Okay. Um, lastly, I just wanna come back to this thing I, I pointed to at the beginning, what, to what extent this could give us prospects of a unified account of meaning. Now we don't have this yet. I'll put out my tentative sketch and I'd love to get your devastating critiques because we, 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 we're something we're all looking for and I wanna improve it. So what is more formally going on in this picture? Um, here's a way to put it, I think. We could say the meaning of a word or some other unit of language, like a phrase or a sentence, in context, in the context of the discourse so far in one of these conversations, the meaning is its incremental contribution to the probability distribution over PLOT expressions in the problem under discussion. So it's building on the idea of a question under discussion in semantics, but here, a problem is both a question, like a query, but also the world model that sets up the, the whole basis for the, this particular bespoke world model that we're thinking about, as well as whatever conditioning information we have. Okay. And crucially, though, I, di I didn't uh, go into this in the examples, um, these code LLMs are probabilistic generative models for code. So the expressions they give in the, in the PLOT, I'm showing you samples, but what they really give you, right, is a distribution on lines of code, and I'm just showing you one typical sample. And if you want to think about meaning from a probabilistic point of view, it's really that probability distribution on code in context. And it's if you want to say, what is the meaning of a word that comes after some other words in a sentence that comes after some other sentences in discourse, it's the incremental contribution to that distribution. More, the more general notion of meaning, like if I want to say, what does this word mean in general? What it means here, or a phrase or sentence, is in general a stochastic function which takes as input a discourse context and returns as output a meaning and context. Stochastic function, so its output is a distribution on functions, functional code in the language of thought. Now this draws or certainly relates to many interesting ideas in contemporary semantic theory, like for example, Paul Petrosky's ideas, um, which I wish I understood better. So when I say that it relates to them in my very limited understanding of them, um, and, but hopefully what you can see, even though I, I don't have time to go into any more specifics or any more real formalism, is ways in which setting this the notion, these notions of meaning both in context and in general, really do bring together all these different aspects of meaning. In particular, the, the PLOT part is really doing the work behind the compositional logical aspects of meaning and the grounding, because grounding really isn't grounding in perception and action, but in the conceptual systems that we use to think about the physical world and our actions and other people's actions in them. 
which are embodied in all those PLOT components we've previously built. And then the LLMs give the distributional statistical aspects as well as the pragmatic aspects. Although really, again, I think the, the, the right way to do pragmatics is some resource rational uh, hybrid or frontier really between the amortized inference that you have in the code LLMs and more sort of RSA probabilistic inference style. So to sum up then, um, I've, I've shown you how uh, a sketch of how the, the combination of, let's say, LLMs and PLOT is a lot better than either one on its own, more or less. <laughs> Each of those are cool ideas um, and do remarkable things when it comes to thinking about thinking and talking about language. But I don't think either one is, is anything like the whole story, but put them together and we, we get a computational architecture for language-informed thinking, or at least the, the prospects of one, and maybe some steps towards a unified account of meaning. There's many future questions, but since I have zero minutes left, I'll just put those up. And if you wanna um, ask about them, happy to. I mean, uh, the many, many, obviously many unaddressed questions here and I'm um, happy to take questions or just defer things to the panel or discussion afterwards. Thank you.